Good morning, and I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to speak, even though I would have loved to come and visit the Philippines and have the opportunity to get to know your beautiful country. I'm still happy to share these three lectures, and I hope you find them informative and also practical. I have no relevant disclosures. According to the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program associated with the NIH, uh, also called SEER, new cases of anal cancer account for only 0.5% of new cancer cases compared to 8.2% uh, for colorectal uh, carcinoma. It also accounts for only 0.2% of all cancer deaths, also compared with almost 9% for colorectal cancer. As a result of its rarity, and depending on where you practice, of course, some of us may feel a certain degree of discomfort when it comes to anal neoplasia and preneoplasia. Now, in this lecture, we will review the lower anogenital tract um, standardized terminology recommendations published back in 2013. We're going to also review the histologic features of squamous HPV-associated lesions, including ancillary studies and also a couple of pitfalls. And then finally, we're going to discuss recently described glandular HPV-associated lesions. Rates for new anal cancer cases have been rising steadily on average 2.2% in recent years, while death rates have been rising on average about 3% each, each year uh, over the span of time between 2008 and 2017. In terms of five-year relative survival, um, the it's not horrible. The five-year relative survival is almost uh, seventy percent, and that goes increases to almost eighty-two percent for cases of localized anal cancer. But for metastatic disease, this number falls to approximately thirty-four percent. Now, let's talk a little bit about risk factors for anal cancer. Approximately 28% of men and 1% of women diagnosed with anal squamous cell carcinoma are infected with HIV. The cumulative incidence by the age of 75 um, in HIV infected patients is approximately 1.5% compared with only 0.05% for the general population. In addition, HIV positive uh, men who have sex with men are about 80 times more likely to develop invasive anal cancer relative to HIV uninfected men. Also, HIV patients are typically diagnosed at our younger age. Now, the incidence have of anal cancer seems to have increased uh, following the um, era of highly active antiretroviral therapy. Uh, following heart, HIV infected patients are living much longer lives. And as a result, the natural history of HPV infection and progression to invasive cancer is also more likely to occur as, as these patients are living longer. So it is not surprising that the incidence um, has increased post the heart era. Now, when it comes to HIV positive women, a study of 153 patients with long term anogenital surveillance um, showed um, a lack of H cell in it, in, in, shows that a lack of high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions in an HIV positive woman does not preclude her from having anal squamous preneoplasia. They found that 72% of anal H cell uh, occurs in these women without a history of pre-existing genital disease or after a long latency following a genital H cell diagnosis. Now, chronic immunosuppression unrelated to HIV also carries an increased risk of development of AIN and invasive cancer, as does um, cigarette smoking. <laughs> 
But the most or the strongest risk factor for anal cancer and dysplasia, we all know is HPV infection as approximately 90% of anal cancers are associated with HPV. And then underlying risk factors that increase the risk for HPV infection include, for example, the number of sexual partners, a history of receptive anal intercourse, of course, as we mentioned, um, HIV infection or immunosuppression, and a prior history of an HPV-related neoplasm. Now, in 2013, the College of American Pathologists, together with the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, published consensus recommendations standardizing the lower anogenital squamous terminology and stratifying based on risk of progressive disease and better reproducibility than a three-tiered system. So instead of having AIN1, AIN2, and AIN3, cases previously classified as AIN1 now should be documented or diagnosed as low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, while Cases previously uh, uh, stratified as AIN2 and 3 should be lumped into high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. I use, or here at Hopkins, we use LCIL and HCIL, but then in parentheses, we uh, designate the appropriate AIN terminology, AIN1, 2, or 3, uh, for people who are not familiar with uh, the new um, classification or terminology. And also they recommended the term superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma for minimally invasive squamous cell cancer that has been completely excised and is potentially amenable to conservative surgical therapy. And we'll show, and we'll talk a little bit more about this a little bit further on in the talk. Now, very quickly about P16, and we know that HPV is a double-stranded circular DNA virus that integrates into the host genome of the squamous epithelium. Now, in the non-HPV infected cell shown, shown here on the left, the CDK complex phosphorylates RB. Uh, which is a tumor suppressor protein, and this leads to release of the E2F transcription factor into its active state, which allows for cellular proliferation. And now P16 is a tumor suppressor and negative regulator of this CDK46 um, complex. Now in HPV infection, shown here on the right, the overexpression of HPV E7 oncoprotein hijacks this PRB setting E2F free into a permanently active state and allowing for cell proliferation. And then in a regulatory feedback attempt, P16 is upregulated and we can exploit that upregulation of P16 uh, to help us classify lesions as high grade in cases that are histologically equivocal. Now, the 2013 last uh, lower anogenital squamous terminology had gave specific guidelines as to when we are supposed to use uh, P16 immunohistochemical staining to assign these lesions to a specific category. And they include when you are considering HCL versus a non-neoplastic mimicker, such as immature squamous metaplasia, repair, the common occurrence of tangential sectioning, and also also transitional zone epithelium, which sometimes can look a little bit like H cell. Also, we should use P16 when we're trying to decide between anal intraepithelial neoplasia grade one versus two, since AIN2 can show a little bit of subjectivity um, in, in diagnosis. And also when there's professional disagreement in interpretation between colleagues, and one of them uh, includes in the differential diagnosis the, the, the possibility of high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Now, P16 is not recommended when your diagnosis is clear-cut on HNE as AIN1 or AIN3. So only use it when you're considering the possibility of AIN2, which will make a significant difference in terms of management between a low-grade lesion and a high-grade lesion. Now, a recent study showed that when there is no need per the guidelines, inter-observer agreement is substantial to almost perfect with a two-tier diagnosis. Uh, and that we're talking about P16. And then when P16 use is indicated but is not performed, inter-observer agreement is much lower. <laughs> 
Now let's do a quick question. Can P16 be positive in non-high-grade squamous intraepithelial anal samples? And the answer, as you might expect, is yes. Approximately 2% of uh, cases with normal histology can show P16 immunoreactivity, and approximately 7% of cases of low cell slash condyloma can also show positivity with P16. On the other hand, can I have P16 positive, uh, negativity in a case Case that is on H&E diagnostic of H cell, and the the question, the answer, of course, is yes. Approximately 24% of AIN2 cases are negative for p16, and approximately 10% of AIN3 cases are also negative for p16. Now, let's talk a little bit about the clinical basics of. Um, anal exam. Here at Hopkins, we are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Sandy Fang, not only as one of our colorectal surgeons, but also as an expert in examination and sampling of the anal canal uh, via high resolution anoscopy, which is a technique modeled off of colposcopy for cervical cancer. Similar to colposcopy, 5% uh, acetic acid is used to identify areas of rapid uh, cell growth as seen here. And then this plastic tissue will turn white after contact with this acetic acid, and this is called acetowhitening. I, these to me seem very subtle findings, and this, this type of procedure requires a lot of um, performing a lot of these uh, procedures to become uh, proficient in, 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 this, in this technique. And then after acetic acid, Lugol solution is used to improve biopsy yield and accuracy since higher grade dysplastic lesions initially found with acetic acid will not take up Lugol solution. And here we have an area that is probably high grade that is not having a lot of Lugol uptake. Though HRA is considered standard of care for any patient with prior abnormal pap test, there is equipment requirement. And as I mentioned, there's a substantial learning curve associated with its use. And according to the literature, it takes approximately 200 procedures between providers become proficient. As a result, HRA is typically utilized as a second line screening tool for abnormal anal pap tests or HPV results. So so anything ASCUS and above here would go to HRA uh, with biopsy. Now, in terms of histology, uh, we should all have in mind, and this is especially important for trainees in the audience, that a biopsy from the anus can display glandular, transitional, or squamous mucosa. This specimen shows squamous mucosa here in the arrow, and then some glandular here, and then transitional mucosa here in the middle. And then if we hone in in this area right here, we can take a closer look at what that transitional mucosa looks like. And it shows a mixture of squamous and glandular differentiation with intermixed goblet cells, which may or may not be present depending on the patient. Now, in some cases, you don't have that very gradual transitional zone, but you can have an abrupt change from rectal glandular mucosa here on the right to squamous mucosa on the left, and maybe with a couple of glands, rectal glands underneath the squamous epithelium, and that's completely normal as well. And this is an example of what anal glands look like. These are mucus secreting glands lined by stratified columnar epithelium. Sometimes you can have also some goblet cells interspersed. And they're almost always associated with this brisk lymphocyte and plasmacytic response um, around them. Uh, the, these, the secretions from these glands tend to uh, empty into the anal sinuses. And it's important to know that these can sometimes undergo squamous metaplasia, similar to um, salivary glands. These are rare to encounter, but it's important to know that they can be there. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, squamous intraepithelial lesions. This is a classic no-brainer example of a low cell showing immature cells uh, limited to the bottom third of the epithelium. And here in this example, we have obvious coilocytes. 
The nuclei are centrally located. They are hyperchromatic. They tend to be irregular and surrounded by this large, very obvious clear halo. And I wish all of the cases of losal in the anus looked like this. And the reality in our experience is that very few of them show this very classic fairy tale morphology. And more often than not, we have things like this. We have cases like this where identification that as uh, anal squamous intraepithelial lesion rests on the identification, not of the coilocytes, but of at low power, you see nuclear disorganization. And then if you look at higher magnification, you can see dyskeratosis as indicated by the arrows here, and you may or may not see binucleation. So those are three very important or helpful clues when you don't have good coilocytes to think of nuclear disorganization, dyskeratosis, and binucleation. And this is the setting in which I find the use of my HPV 611 in situ hybridization very useful because whenever the findings are subtle, and this has happened to me on more than one occasion, I can use my HPV 611-ish to help me feel more confident about the diagnosis. Now, this is rare, but you can see it once in a while. While some lesions are flat, like the ones I just um, showed, others feature this exuberant papillary exophytic surface. And these are, by definition, the true condylomas, which uh, require this exophytic papillary configuration. Now, here is an example of a case showing all of the above features, including immature cells limited to the lower third. You have your coilocytes, you have your dyskeratosis, and you have your racinoid irregular nuclei, as indicated by the red arrow. Note the mitotic figures limited to the basal third of the epithelium inside of the yellow circle. Now, high-grade lesions are characterized by the presence of immature cells to, at the, uh, occupying at least the two inferior thirds of the squamous epithelium. Lesions such as this one with immature cells limited to the lower two-thirds of the epithelium are designated as H-cell and previously as AIN2 in, with the older terminology. Now, lesions with immature cells occupying the entire thickness of the epithelium are classified as HL as well and AIN3 in the old terminology. And some lesions can be less than cell, less than 10 cells thick, and some people refer to this as thin H cell. Both AIN2 2 and AIN3 will show strong and diffuse uh, immunoreactivity, uninterrupted blood-like staining in basal and parabasal zones with P16. You, not, you don't necessarily have to have superficial staining. So sometimes the staining is basal and parabasal. And then in cases of losal, you'll see discontinuous patchy nuclear and cytoplasmic staining, and this is considered negative, as indicated here in the upper um, center in the setting of losal. Now, one issue that often comes through the consult service is when areas of AIN colonize adjacent colorectal glands as seen right here. Examples such as this one are not problematic because you can see the glands in the process of being colonized such as here and here. And this is an example of H cell colonizing a gland is a no brainer. The problem is when there are cases when colonization can be so diffuse as to mimic squamous cell carcinoma. The key here is to note the rounded contours of these nests in the absence of stromal desmoplasia. And here you can see, if you search diligently, most of the time you will find partially colonized glands, such as this one indicated with the blue arrow. So rounded nests, no desmoplasia, look for the partially colonized glands before suggesting invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And here's another example of massive glandular colonization by high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And in this case, you can see these nests also almost arranged in a test tube fashion, almost recapitulating the normal organization of the colorectal uh, glands. 
Now, what are the treatment options for anal intraepithelial neoplasia? The answer is, so the short answer is that size dictates treatment. So lesions that are small are typically treated with topical by topical means, and then large lesions require procedures such as infrared coagulation, electrocautery, and cryotherapy. An important thing to note is that all of these show similar efficacy in resolving or downgrading in resolving or downgrading H cell, but all of them unfortunately fail to prevent recurrence in most patients. So all patients that are treated require close follow-up with HRA to detect any recurrence early as recurrences are amenable to therapy. Now we know that HIV positive individuals, as we mentioned, are at risk for anal cancer. Why is it then that there are no screening guidelines similar to women with cervical cancer? And the answer is that it has not been proven to prevent cancer associated morbidity and mortality. Now this may be changing in the next few years as a study called the ANCHOR study is addressing whether treating HCL affects the incidence of anal cancer. Answer. And this, this study started a few years ago, so I'm expecting results in the near, in the near future. Let's talk a little bit about squamous cell carcinoma. Now, most of these, most of the cases that look like this are not a diagnostic issue. You have your single cells infiltrating a markedly desmoplastic stroma. So this is a no-brainer. Unfortunately, no other cases read the books or attend these lectures. And many times we find ourselves, at least I find myself struggling to be comfortable with the diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. And this is such an example. In cases such as this one, different observers may have different opinions. All would agree that this is neoplastic, a neoplastic squamous process, but not all would agree on whether there is invasion or is this all tangential sectioning of massively colonized rectal glands. There was known as moplasia, and I was uncomfortable with the diagnosis of invasive squamous cell cancer, but did not like it for glandular colonization because of the irregular borders and massive effacement of the glandular architecture. And I, I, I asked for help from my head and neck colleagues who are used to looking at squamous lesions. I have no, no, no pride, no shame. And uh, she agreed that she would only make it as far, as far as suspicious for invasion. And that's the way we ended up releasing this case. So some cases are not black and white. Now, the last guidelines recommended the term superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma for minimally invasive squamous cell cancers of the lower anogenital tract that have been completely excised and that are potentially amenable to conservative surgical therapy. This refers to a carcinoma that has an invasive depth of a maximum of three millimeters as measured from the adjacent most superficial derm or papilla to the deepest point of invasion, and also that has a maximum horizontal spread of seven millimeters and that has been completely excised. So the margins need to be negative. Now, LVI is not part of the definition of CISCA, but should be reported, uh, as should be the presence, number, and size of independent multifocal carcinomas in the specimen. Now, though the most recent WHO classification argues against subtyping squamous cell carcinoma, given the lack of biological significance, it is my opinion that adenosquamous carcinoma, albeit exceedingly rare, should be documented. This tumor typically presents at an advanced stage, although patients may report uh, mild or no symptoms as reported by colleagues at Mayo Clinic in a recent platform presentation at the USCAP. Horton and colleagues also report high rates of tumor budding, MMR loss, and frequent recurrences and poor prognosis. Some observers, as a result, think that this histology should be considered an adverse prognostic feature in the colon and rectum. Now, whether this translates to the anus or to anal cancers is uncertain, but in my opinion, it should be worth documenting in their report. And this is an, another view of the same case that I just showed in the previous slide, showing the presence of large vessel invasion.
Some studies have emphasized the prognostic value of p53 expression and HPV negativity with both of these associating with inferior overall recurrence-free survival in patients with anal squamous cell carcinoma. So our oncology clinical colleagues may be asking us to perform p53 in many of these cases down the road. Now, it is worth remembering that basaloid squamous cell cancer can be treacherous and that it can display spindle cell features as well as CD117 expression, making it a pitfall with gastrointestinal stromal tumor. This example, for example, shows, it looks a little bit sarcomatoid and could be potentially confused with a gist. It can also reflect or manifest this nested appearance similar to that of neuroendocrine tumors. And the differential diagnosis for this example would be with high-grade uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma, probably small cell, although the cells have a little bit too much cytoplasm than your typical small cell cancer. I would say that lymphoma would also be in the differential for this since it is also a little bit discohesive. Now, this case presented a pitfall in that it was CD117 positive and initially was interpreted as a gist, a cautionary tale to always perform a pattern of stains, even if limited, before flat out labeling a weird looking tumor as a gist in the anus. Uh, thankfully, this tumor also had P63 expression as well as CK56, and we were able to assign it in the category of Bessaloid squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this other example could easily be confused with a small cell carcinoma or even melanoma. As you can see, this can be problematic on H&E. Thankfully, these are consistently, basaloid squamous cell is consistently positive for P16 and associated with HPV, and they are immunoreactive with SOX2, which helps in the differential with BCC or basal cell carcinoma of the perianal skin. Uh, to make matters a bit more complicated, basaloid squamous cell comes in more than one histologic flavor, including this transitional cell-like morphology or pattern, basaloid with peripheral palisading, adenoid cystic carcinoma-like, and a mucinous microcystic pattern. Thankfully, these all staying like squamous cell cancers with CK56 and P40. What useful features we can use on H&E to differentiate squamous cell carcinoma, basaloid squamous cell versus basal cell carcinoma? Number one would be the location. Uh, if it's located in the perianal skin, our suspicion or the possibility of basal cell carcinoma should be in the back of our heads. These tend to have a significant retraction artifact and they lack atypical mitotic figures. In addition, basal cell carcinoma is consistently P16 negative, so this is very helpful. And of course, uh, also worthwhile to throw in neuroendocrine markers when you're entertaining the possibility of basaloid SCC to make sure that you're not dealing with a neuroendocrine carcinoma. Now, besides P16, you can employ Berry P4, BCL2, CDK2A, CDKN2A, and SOX2 to help you differentiate between basal cell and basal squamous cell. Um, the first two, Berry P4 and BCL2, if negative, would argue for basaloid squamous cell carcinoma, as would immunoreactivity for CDKN2A uh, and SOX2. Now let's talk a little bit about HPV-associated glandular lesions. Now anal adenocarcinoma is rare. Uh, it, some think that the anal adenocarcinoma some have uh, published uh, evidence to suggest that anal adenocarcinoma uh, develops through HPV-dependent and independent pathways. The transitional type anal gland of anal adenocarcinoma, that means uh, CK7 positive, 20 negative, half of these cases are associated, almost half of these cases are associated with high-risk HPV, while HPV has not been seen in association with colorectal type anal adenos, the ones that are CK7 negative, CK20 positive. Now, we recently described our experience with a rare subset of HPV-driven anal adenocarcinomas that have peculiar morphology and that affect the anal genital region in both men and women. 
at low magnification, these are almost, almost always characterized by this majestic villoglandular configuration as seen in the, the first slide and then in this other slide as well. This example is from the vagina and looks a little bit more solid because it's not exophytic, uh, like the other two that I showed initially from the anus, but you can still see some papillary structures here in the middle of these solid areas. In the anal canal, you often see underlying lymphoid aggregates at the base of the tumor, and we saw this in examples from the anus. Cytologically, these look very similar to HPV type uh, driven usual um, endocervical adenocarcinomas in that they feature prominent or frequent apoptosis and frequent superficial mitosis. We saw some examples with area of cribiforming and a variable quantity of mucin ranging from abundant as seen here to less abundant as seen in this other half of the gland to very abundant to the point that cells have this clear cell appearance. Now this villiform appearance may be seen in even in small samples and can be diagnostically helpful. And even in small samples, you can see this variability in mucin content and both the villiform architecture and the variable mucin from area of the biopsy to another area of the biopsy can be clues for you to think, hmm, is this an anal um, adenocarcinoma associated with high-risk HPV? On immunostains, these lesions are diffusely positive for CK7 and P16 and either HPV in situ hybridization or PCR. CK20 can show focal immunoreactivity as can CDX2. In our series, only one of nine cases was positive for PAX8, so that tends to be negative. And all cases tested were negative for ER and PR. Now let's talk about some pitfalls uh, in, with anal neoplasia, with anal lesions. The first one I want to talk about is that there are some cases where you can identify more than one type of squamous intraepithelial lesion, as in, as in this case, which consisted mostly of areas of low cell and a very sneaky area, almost it could be easily, easily missed, that when looked at a higher power makes you think or made us think about the possibility of a high-grade uh, squamous intraepithelial lesion. And indeed, we corroborated our suspicion with a P16, which shows nice, strong, block-like immunoreactivity in this focus uh, of h cell, and then areas of low cell show this patchy staining interpreted as negative. We also did our high-risk HPV in situ hybridization, which was nicely positive in this area of h cell and negative in the low cell areas. Now, these papillary areas in the middle can be also tricky because at high power, they can look like H cell, giving their immature look. But note the lack of P16 immunoreactivity similar to the low cell on the right uh, and compare that with area of positivity in the H cell area. And this was described a few years ago and coined as papillary immature metaplasia of the anal canal. And this is almost always, is always characterized by slender papilla lined by immature squamous cells and almost always in close proximity to conventional exophytic low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And the only important thing to remember about this entity is the fact that it can be a mimic of H cell. So when in doubt and you have these papillary areas and you wanna call it H cell, do your P16 and you make sure that you get um, strong immunoreactivity. Now let's end with a case. This is a 70 year old woman with a rectal polyp. And she showed in her polypectomy invasive carcinoma, but it had a variable morphology. You have this glandular looking areas here with a moid squamoid looking areas here on the left. Now some areas on high power were clearly glandular other areas show these nests with creepy forming and a suggestion of this peripheral palisading with very frequent apoptotic bodies. And then other areas showed a mixture of cells with mucinous and non-mucinous cytoplasm and also a peppering of neutrophils and apoptotic activity. <laughs> 
On immunostain, this was completely or diffusely immunoreactive with CK7 with only focal immunoreactivity for CDX2. On high-risk HPV, in situ hybridization, there was diffuse positivity. Now, I was very confused when I saw this case. The reason why I suspected it was HPV driven, it was because of this variable mucin within the lesion, but I still didn't know how to classify it because it did not fit the villiform structure or characteristics that we identified in the initial nine cases. So I shared this case with our colleagues in gynecologic pathology as I do with many of these cases, since they have so much experience with HPV squamous lesions. And they educated me on stratified mucin producing invasive carcinoma and intraepithelial lesion of the female gynecologic tract. This case is probably the anal counterpart of this HPV driven carcinoma described in women. And this was described back in the year 2000. And it's a tumor that has hybrid squamous and glandular histologic features and can mimic adenosquamous carcinoma. And it's important not to classify it as such, since as we discussed, adenosquamous has a poor prognosis. And we'll talk about the prognosis of these HPV-driven lesions in a little bit. Now, the WHO classifies this SMILE as a variant of adenocarcinoma in situ. Now, intraepithelial lesions uh, in the female and the gynecologic tract are characterized by this intraepithelial proliferation of columnar immature epithelium with intracytoplasmic mucin, which can be highlighted by a mucin stain. They tend to have this rounded stromal um, interface um, uh, configuration as well, characterized as our case by frequent mitotic figures, apoptotic bodies with or without abundant neutrophils, and maybe seeing an association with high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions. As expected, these lesions are strongly immunoreactive with P16. And the invasive counterpart may show infiltration of the stroma um, by these solid nests with at least the presence of focal mucin. Also like our case, they show, they tend to show this peripheral palisading and variable intracytoplasmic mucin. And you may or may not see uh, a, a stratified mucin producing intraepithelial lesion or adenocarcinoma in situ or areas of H cell. They can be completely pure, or you can have a mixture of invasive stratified mucin producing carcinoma or mixed with other types of carcinoma, such as usual type adenome, adenosquamous, mucinous, and neuroendocrine carcinoma. Oops. Now, what is the prognosis of HPV associated anal carcinoma? So far, they have been indolent, but there are too few cases to draw solid conclusions. In our case, and in, in our paper, we did not see any patients with metastatic disease, only um, one patient with a recurrence after I think it was six years. Since then, I have seen one patient with metastatic disease to the lymph nodes and a colleague sent me a case um, from out of, out, of the, out of the country of a patient with this type of tumor metastatic to the lungs, so they can certainly metastasize. Now, in summary, HPV-associated adenocarcinoma, as we mentioned, can affect the anus uh, and also the lower gynecologic tract. Uh, it can affect both men and women, and it could have a villoglandular or mucinous pseudostratified morphology, but I want to bet everything I have that there are other morphologies that we are going to start seeing and identifying that we're on to these glandular HPV-driven lesions. Remember that the cytologic and immunohistochemical features are similar to high-risk HPV-related endocervical adeno. So if you have a tumor in the anus that just looks funny, it just looks strange, reminds me a little bit of cervical adeno, let's think about a primary anal adenocarcinoma uh, driven by HPV, of course, provided that the patient doesn't have a history of um, a gynecologic malignancy. And finally, so far, these are indolent, but I think more data is uh, are needed to to definitely say for sure. And with that, I thank you and I would be happy to take any questions.
My next lecture is titled Sexually Transmitted Infections, Epidemiolog Epidemiologic Trends, and Aerodigestive Manifestations. I have no relevant disclosures. In 2017, a total of approximately 30,000 cases of primary and secondary syphilis were reported in the US, uh, yielding a rate of 9.5 cases per 100,000 population. Now, this rate reflects a 10.5% increase compared to 2016 and a whopping 72.7% .7 increase compared to 2013. This happened after approximately 66 years of near consistent decrease in rates following the discovery and wide use of penicillin in the 1940s. Combined cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis reached an all-time high here in the U.S. in 2018, according to uh, the annual Sexually Transmitted Disease Surveillance Report released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in the U.S. And here in Baltimore, where we practice, we have the highest rate of STIs in the United States with two cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis per 100,000 residents, per, per every 100 residents, rather. Uh, chlamydia was the most common, followed by gonorrhea and syphilis. The objectives today for this lecture are to summarize a little bit the national epidemiologic trends as they relate to sexually transmitted infections. And most of this data is gonna come from the Centers for uh, Disease Control here in the United States. Uh, identify who is the population at risk. Discuss a little bit of the clinical features of patients with sexually transmitted infections of the aerodigestive tract, and more importantly for us pathologists, identify and be able to recognize patterns of inflammation that can help us um, point, pinpoint or suggest a diagnosis in uh, infected patients. Oops, I need to move my camera here. So why the change? The concept of disease, we, when I was growing up, these were known as sexually transmitted infections. Uh, now there's a push to change the terminology from STD to sexually transmitted infection or STI. So wh why has this been, why is this a thing? Why, why was STD a problem? Uh, well, the concept of disease as an STD suggests a clear and obvious medical problem. Usually, a patient with obvious signs and symptoms. But several of the most common uh, sexually transmitted infections have no signs or symptoms if the majority of patients infected, or if the patients have signs and symptoms, they may be subtle to the point that they can be clinically easily missed. Um, so, um, the sexually transmitted virus or bacteria can be described as creating infection, which may or may not result in a disease. Uh, now, we know all that this is true of chlamydia, gonorrhea, herpes, and HPV, um, to name a few. And for this reason, uh, some professionals, uh, organizations have are, are having this push to replace STD by STI. And I think more importantly, when it comes to patient care, STD, STI does not have yet as much of this negative connotation or stigma or shame that STD carries with it. Now, in 2018, men accounted for a large majority, almost 90% of primary and secondary syphilis cases. Of those, the majority reported a history of having sex with other men. So this is an infection that disproportionately affects men, specifically men who have sex with men. Now, in women and men who have sex with women, infections are increasing also to a lesser degree, but infection tends not to be associated with a particular sexual behavior. And instead, there are data saying that this may be more in keeping or more associated with reported use of injection drug use, methamphetamine use, and sex with a person who injects drug. During 2014 to 
2018 time period, the primary and secondary syphilis rates increased among all races uh, or Hispanic ethnicity groups. The greatest increase as indicated by the blue arrow was observed among Native Americans uh, slash Alaska Natives at 41%. Reported cases of primary and secondary syphilis continue to be characterized as in previous years by a high rate of HIV co-infection, particularly among men who have sex with other men. Among 2018 primary and secondary reported syphilis cases with known HIV status, 42% as indicated by the arrow, 42% um, of these cases were uh, uh, among men who have sex with men were HIV positive compared to only 8% of cases among men who have sex with women and 4% of cases among, um, among women. Now, a recent disturbing trend here in the US is the increase in the number of congenital syphilis cases, uh, which goes hand in hand with an increase in reported cases, not surprisingly, of primary and secondary reported syphilis cases among women aged 15 to 44 years of age, as indicated here in this graph by the black arrow. And a recent CDC publication, which I have put here um, the link, indicates or suggests that half of United States cases of newborn syphilis cases uh, or, or congenital, uh, also known as congenital syphilis, uh, in 2018 occur because of two reasons. One is gaps in testing or um, lack of timely prenatal care. From 2009 to 2018, similarly reported cases of gonorrhea increased by a whopping 83% since this historic low in 2009. And again, similarly to syphilis, the estimated gonorrhea case rate among men who have sex with men increased an astounding 376%. This is from 2010 to 2018. Now, over the same time period, cases in women and men who have sex with women also increased, but to a much lesser degree than in men who have sex with men, uh, than in men who have sex with men. In terms of chlamydia, the rate of reported cases of chlamydia among women was still high, was still about two times the rate among males in 2018, likely reflecting, of course, a larger number of women who are regularly screened for this infection. However, from 2013 to 2017, the rate in men increased by about 40%, whereas the rate in women increased by only 11%. And it's not clear why the reasons for these is, but potential reasons include a considerable increase in male cases um, due to perhaps true increase in infections or improved screening coverage in men who are at risk for STIs. Now, these trends are not specific or isolated here to the United States. These trends are being seen globally wherever this data uh, are being reported. Uh, for example, from this paper from the European nation, from the um, uh, European, from Europe and the European economic area, uh, also showing a disproportionate number of cases of syphilis, men who have sex with men, um, uh, of syphilis, um, LGV and gonorrhea in men who have sex with men compared to women and men who have sex with women. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves and that I asked myself when I was preparing for this lecture is, why are we seeing this now? Why all of a sudden, after all of these years of decreased infections, uh, we're seeing this dramatic rise? Uh, and, and, and when I dug into the literature, I found a couple of potential reasons. So it may be a multifactorial problem. Uh, there seem to be information gaps in patients about syphilis and the related behavior. For example, according to one study out of France, only 37% of men who have sex with men are aware of the fact that syphilis can be transmitted via oral sex. 
Another potential uh, explanation is lack of testing as a quarter, up to a quarter of patients at risk are reported, are reporting not being tested. And then another potential explanation is um, there seems to be an association between infection and men who seek partner, men who seek partners online or via phone apps. According to some study, this geosocial networking is associated with greater odds for testing positive for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Also, there are, as we all know, changing perceptions of HIV infection and how lethal it is. And perhaps individuals are getting more comfortable with condomless sex and leading to increased rates of infections. Also, the development of pre-exposure prophylaxis seems to play a role as some studies show that men who have sex with men taking PrEP are up to almost 45 times more likely to contract syphilis than MSM um, individuals who are not on PrEP. And they also report um, inconsistent or even absent condom use, men who, have, men who report being on pre-exposure prophylaxis. And then I think there's also gaps in terms of educating our medical students. Um, many of our medical students report not that sexual um, history and sexual health is not emphasized during medical training. 68%, according to a survey of med students, feel that that addressing and treating sexual concerns will be an important part of their careers, yet only 40%, almost 40%, think that they are adequately trained to do so. Less than half of U.S. medical schools lack, um, have a formal sexual health curricula, and medical students report a high degree of discomfort when taking a sexual history, especially in pacer, patients who are very young or patients who are older adults over 75. Half of our medical students also report that most of their experience managing patients with STIs is gained exclusively in their OBGYN rotations. And as a result, not surprisingly, report a low level of comfort, um, not only with, among medical students, but also among residents and fellows with taking sexual histories and addressing sexual concerns in the LGBTQ segment of the population as compared to non-LGBTQ patients. A subset of primary of HIV primary care providers also report lack of testing treatment, uh, lack of testing and treatment knowledge, lack of time, and also like trainees, discomfort taking a sexual history and providing a sexual um, a genital examination. Men who have sex with men also may feel it's irrelevant to disclose or bring up sexual uh, behavior to their general practitioners. And in fact, approximately 75% of them report that they have never been asked. And last but not least here in the US, we have experienced significant budget cuts, both at the state and local level. In recent years, more than half of local programs have experienced these cuts and resulting in clinic closures, shorter hours, reduced screening, loss of staff, and a lesser degree of patient follow-up. Now, all of these lead to challenges both at the bedside and at the scope that can lead to misdiagnosis or missed diagnosis or misdiagnosis. Clin at the clinic, uh, well, the clinical experience with STIs, as we saw from a couple of the previous, the first slides, has significantly decreased with the overall decreasing incidence since the 1940s. As a result, clinicians may not be as well versed in all possible clinical manifestations, which can be sometimes very subtle. The presentation can be highly variable and patients can be indeed completely asymptomatic. And what are the challenges for us as pathologists when trying to suggest a diagnosis or to identify these cases at the scope? We, first of all, do not receive uh, pertinent clinical history mostly because you know clinicians are not thinking about the possibility of SDI uh, when they're seeing the patient most of the time. It may not be, we may not be as familiar with the myriad of patterns of inflammation, which we will discuss in a little bit. And some cases have minimal changes when you look at them on the scope. <laughs> 
And then to add to this, it would be really easy if these cases came to us from SDI clinics. And unfortunately, the vast majority of these cases that we receive come from our gastroenterology, hepatology, ENT, and oral and maxillofacial surgery colleagues. So let's talk a little bit about the clinical findings in these patients. In this series out of Brazil, the most commonly affected site was the lips, followed by the tongue, the buccal mucosa, the labial, labial commissure, and the palate. And even though clinical impressions in some of these cases included the possibility of syphilis, in a subset of patients, clinicians initially thought about other types of infections, including paracoxidoidomycosis and leishmaniasis and diseases such as pemphigoid and also malignancy and herpes virus infection. Now, in HIV patients, a subset of patients can develop what has been called snail track ulcers, which are these raised uh, serpentine, raised whitish looking lesions that have this serpentine reddish uh, border uh, that can be seen both in the hard palate and in the soft palate, as well as in the gingiva. And they are called snail track ulcers because of these serpentine um, borders. Other things that you can see other lesions you can see in HIV positive patients are papules on the tongue and a hairy leukoplakia like type of lesions. And in many of these cases, uh, the possibility of SDI is not um, initially thought about and instead clinicians go down the differential diagnosis of candida, herpes and other diagnostic possibilities. And this is a case from Hopkins provided my, my colleague, Dr. Foss, who is an oral and maxillofacial pathologist, showing a very nice example of that snail track ulcer, as you can see here, that spans from the hard palate into the soft palate, being white in the center and having this very irregular serpentine erythematous border. And I won't go over this, but it's just to show you the whole host of differential diagnosis that these lesions can provoke when in the oral mucosa, and this is specifically for syphilis, depending on the look of the lesion, whether it's ulcerated, uh, erythematous, or nodular, this will display or this will trigger a whole host of differential diagnosis. Now, clinically in the colon, syphilis can look um, very like a very bog, boggy, edematous, and ulcerated mucosa. Importantly, many cases will show a loss of vascular pattern compared here with a normal colon. And when you have that loss of vascular pattern, clinicians start thinking about chronicity and the possibility that this patient may have inflammatory bowel disease. And there's also some associated ulcerations as you see here and here. Nowadays, in patients with chlamydia, uh, LGV, uh, genital tract infection with the classic lymphadenopathy is relatively uncommon and is pretty much a thing of the past. Many of these patients now tend to be men who present with rectal bleeding, rectal pain. Uh, many of them have mucoid discharge and on colonoscopy will show similar to the findings seen in colonic syphilis with erythema, edema, and loss of vascular pattern. To make matters worse, a subset of these patients with LGV can have a reactive polyarthropathy with or without conjunctivitis, mimicking the extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. Let me move my camera a little bit to the right. Now, this is a patient with both chlamydia and syphilis. And here I've put it next to a picture of a patient with ulcerative colitis to show you the degree of similarity that this can show endoscopically and how challenging the job of identifying these lesions based on gross exam can be for our gastroenterology colleagues. Um, Another way that these can present uh, both syphilis and chlamydia is by mass forming lesions that are so dramatic that they can perfectly mimic neoplasia. This is a young patient with a nine centimeter rectal mass who was headed to the OR because the clinicians thought that this patient had colon cancer. And my colleague, Dr. Christina Arnold, um, at the time she was at Ohio State, now she's at um, Colorado University. <laughs> 
uh, she was able to identify on biopsy that this was indeed um, an, a sexually transmitted infection. I believe this was, uh, this ended up being a case of chlamydia and the patient did not, ended up not going to the OR, the patient got antibiotics and Dr. Arnold um, was able to avoid an unnecessary surgery in this patient just by being able to identify the pattern of inflammation. And this is another patient where the clinicians were suspecting also neoplasia, as you can see with this ulcerated polypoid raised mass in the rectum. And even on imaging, the patient had the patient had pre-sacral lymph nodes sus suspicious for metastatic disease. And we will see the uh, histologic correlate of this case a little bit down the road. Now, this is the only case of gonorrhea, isolated gonorrhea that I've seen provided by my colleague, Dr. Singhi at University of Pittsburgh. And you can see also similarly boggy nodular ulcerated mucosa. Now, syphilis can also uh, rarely affect the stomach in infected patients. It can be challenging endoscopically. The stomach may show nodules and hypertrophic irregular folds with ulcerations with heaped up edges that may mimic malignancy. It, patients may initially present with lower GI symptoms like diarrhea and tenesmus, um, reflecting STI-related proctitis, but the diagnosis may be clinically or pathologically overlooked. And then these can get complicated. Syphilis can get complicated specifically in the stomach because they can go on to develop significant hemorrhage, gastric outlet obstruction, and even cases of perforation requiring emergent surgery. Now, this patient is one patient that was identified at one of our sister hospitals, and he had a two by two centimeter ulcer in the proximal stomach that was endoscopically concerning for malignancy. And again, you will see the histologic correlate of this case uh, in a little bit. Syphilis can also give you a hepatitis. Most of these cases uh, occur in men and uh, over half of them are HIV positive. The challenging thing for our hepatology colleagues is that the symptoms that patients with hepat syphilis hepatitis present can have a lot of overlap with hepatitis uh, for other reasons, such as hepatitis B and C and hot autoimmune hepatitis. Um, so this can be also clinically a challenge. The one thing to note is that in patients with syphilis hepatitis, they're only going to have a slight elevation in ALT, ASD, and T bili, but they will have a decent elevation of ALP and GGT. So syphilis tend to be tends to be biliary centric as opposed to attacking predominantly your hepatocytes. And our colleagues at Mass General a couple of years ago published a nice paper in the American Journal of Search Path documenting that patients with hepatic syphilis can present with mass forming lesions in the liver that can be clinically concerning for malignancy. And this is one of the examples that they presented in their paper. But wait, there's more. Syphilis can also affect your pancreas. There is very little in the literature uh, the addressing syphilitic pancreatitis, but patients can present with symptoms that may suggest other possibilities. They may have abdominal pain and marked lipase elevation with fever, glycosuria, and steatorrhea, and even a space occupying lesion, but in the absence of significant wasting. Now, unfortunately, in most of these cases, uh, the little that's in the literature, they are identified post-mortem. So by the time that the patient pretends with pancreatic involvement, it's already too late. So as you can see, clinically, the differential diagnosis of SDI in the GI tract elicits a whole host of potential possibilities, including malignancy uh, in the liver, stomach, rectum, and pancreas, and also the possibility of inflammatory bowel disease. And this is reflected in these three publications published one in 2010, one in 2018, and one in 2021 of reports of multiple men whose diagnosis of STI was delayed up to 36 months after the patients being incorrectly diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, the histologic patterns that we see both in the oral mucosa and in the digestive tract can be variable. 
In 2013, we reported our experience with SDI proctocolitis, and since then, colleagues and other institutions have described histologic patterns in the anal canal uh, and perianal skin and also in the upper aerodigestive tract. And this is an example of the case that I showed initially uh, affecting the hard and soft palate, the histology of how this lesion looked. You can see a psoriasiform pattern of epithelial hyperplasia in the squamous mucosa with uniformly enlarged reedy ridges and this diffuse lichenoid lymphoplasmacytic inflammation underneath the squamous epithelium with a couple of areas showing neutrophils infiltrating a very edematous squamous epithelium with a couple of microabscesses here and there. On close inspection, you can see the prominence of plasma cells, and this is an immunostain for syphilis showing a nice infiltration with the organisms. Now, not all cases are going to be plasma cell rich. Some are plasma cell poor and histiocyte rich. Occasional cases can have eosinophils and a good background of neutrophils. And in some cases of syphilis, the endothelial cells are going to be plump and very, very prominent. And this is its corresponding immunohistochemical stain also for syphilis, showing nice positivity crawling with organisms. And this case is from a lesion in the tongue provided by my colleague, um, Dr. Yantis at Cornell. Now, besides those, there are additional clues that you can look for, including obliterative endarteritis or phlebitis, neuritis, and a histocyte rich or sometimes granulomatous inflammation. But these are less commonly seen than the uh, plasma cell rich or histocyte rich um, lesion. Now, in the colon, when it comes to inflammatory patterns, the sky is pretty much the limit. Here's an example of a case of syphilis involving the anus provided by my colleague, Dr. Epstein. And you can see that it looks very similar to that buccal mucosa lesion with this epidermal hyperplasia that looks psoriasiform and this lichenoid infiltrate underneath the squamous epithelium, this band-like chronic inflammatory infiltrate. Um, these can have poorly formed granulomas as well, which are so poorly formed that they could be easily missed. When you get these biopsies from the anal canal, if the clinician, if the gastroenterologist gets biopsies from the rectum, you can see that concomitant biopsies showing a certain degree of proctitis. On the immunohistochemical staying, the organisms may be seen in a perivascular location, or many times in my experience, you see them at the junction between the squamous epithelium and the lamina propria. And many of these can have sometimes a very dramatic pseudoepitheliumatous hyperplasia that can sometimes be concerning for the possibility of squamous cell carcinoma, and that's given that intense lichenoid infiltrate. And this is a close magnification of that case I just showed, showing the prominence of plasma cells. In the anus, you can have a tumoral form, just like what I was talking about with chlamydia in the rectum, and these can be concerning for malignancy. You can see ulcerated areas and the tumor being formed by this dramatic fibrosis underneath. When you look at higher magnification, you may be able to observe that the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate tends to conglomerate around the vessels. This perivascular accentuation sometimes is very helpful. And again, in the anus, sarcoid-like granulomas have also been reported. And these are the histologic slides of the case that I presented before with the presacral with the presacral lymphadenopathy as seen here. And the histologic slides were extremely concerning for lymphoma on a histologic exam. And that's because this one was lymphocyte rich and had not as much in the way of plasma cells as the other cases that I've shown. But my colleague, Dr. Mariam karat Pezu, who's now at Northwestern, was able to identify the pattern of inflammation inflammation first because she saw this very poor, um, poorly formed granuloma down below. And she also noticed that this process was associated with a certain degree of at least focal active inflammation. So she ordered a syphilis immunohistochemical stain and that was nicely positive. And this is an example of uh, a rectal lesion that was plasma cell 
poor and it was histicide rich as you can see here and some of these might even be plump um, endothelial cells so just keep in mind and remind yourself that these not only have to be plasma cell rich some of them are histicide rich and this is a case that was identified proudly by one of our fellows at the time, uh, Dr. James Miller, who is now um, in academic practice in Wisconsin. And this is a case of chlamydia that showed a little bit of inflammation, not a whole lot, mainly histiocytic, but showed these very nice prolapse type changes. And we have seen that in a couple of cases associated with chlamydia. And this is the corresponding endoscopy, which showed this proctitis with ulcerated areas. And now in the past, we didn't have an immunostain like in syphilis to identify chlamydia, but now my colleague, Dr. Kevin Waters at Cedars-Sinai has uh, reported on an RNA in situ hybridization stain that is now available for the identification of chlamydia. And that's a, a really nice recent development. Some cases have no glands whatsoever and you only have granulation tissue. This is a case of both chlamydia and syphilis and the only way the only reason why I thought about the diagnosis was because it was so plasma cell rich. And the patient indeed had a history when we dug into the chart of both chlamydia and syphilis um, partially treated. In the rectum, these can also have this tumoral form and you can see areas of ulceration here and this marked submucosal fibrosis with this lymphoid aggregates that tend to be very um, uh, nicely hugging a couple of the vessels. Now on histology, as you can see, this can also bring up the possibility of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the difference here is that the degree of architectural distortion in cases of STI is very minimal. The architecture tends to be preserved. It can also bring up the possibility only of lymphoma as we saw in that case from Dr. Karad and of another infection unrelated to STI. In our experience and that of others, even if we propose SDI um, histologically, or even if we prove it immunohistochemically in an individual, clinicians may still treat as IBD or rebiopsy in cases where malignancy is a clinical, a primary clinical concern. Now the histology in the stomach can look very dramatic. And this is a case with, and of the case that I presented with the patient with the proximal gastric lesion and shows a markedly expanded lamina propria by lymphocytes, plasma cells, and neutrophils. The degree of inflammation is beyond what we see in the setting of H. helicobacter infection. Some cases can have marked wall edema and also plenty of associated lymphoid aggregates. And when you look closely, if your sample includes a decent degree of some mucosa, you can see very helpful lymph perivascular lymphoplasmacytic coughing, uh, coughing, perhaps with some endothelial injury and swelling as you see here, right here. And the degree of glandular destruction is usually really dramatic and something that you don't see in cases of Helicobacter pylori. And here you have a higher magnification showing you areas of neutrophilic infiltration of the glands. And the initial diagnostic possibility or in impression for the submitting pathologist was initially of lymphoma. And indeed, some cases can have lymphoepithelial-like lesions. And then the second diagnostic impression after that was ruled out was the possibility of EBV gastritis, which is not also a bad idea either. But we ordered... Um, syphilis immunostain, and that was nicely positive. Now, I must say that in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, specifically in the colon, in our experience, most of these cases tend to be negative on immunohistochemical stains, um, as we reported back in 2013. But the data so far, especially from um, sites such as the liver, say that most of the cases, over 50% of the cases, are positive on, on IHC. So I'm not really exactly sure of the reason why, cases from the colorectum tend to be negative even in infected patients. <laughs> 
this is why communication is key. For this particular patient with this uh, gastric involvement, there was no, absolutely no high risk behavior documented on the chart after we just went and combed that chart up and down. But the hospitalist noticed while we working up the case, separately noticed a palmar rash and order an RPR, which came positive at one in 520. And the patient was diagnosed with a secondary syphilis. Now, in the liver, our, our colleagues at uh, Beth Israel uh, presented in abstract form their experience with 10 cases, all men, six of them HIV positive, six of them with a history of having sex with other men. And there were a whole host of inflammatory patterns, including a biliary type pattern, an acute hepatitis like pattern, and a patternless pattern. So um, the biliary pattern is not only specific, uh, you may not only see a biliary pattern in the setting of syphilis, sometimes you can have more of a hepatitis, acute hepatitis-like pattern. And in their experience, 60% of the cases were positive in IHC, which is different from our experience uh, in the lower GI tract. And this is a case that we had of syphilis in the liver. And you can see this massive destruction. There's a little bit of hepatocytes left here on the right. And this massive destruction and infiltration of the hepatic parenchyma, predominantly by uh, lymphocytes, some plasma cells, uh, but also a couple of neutrophils in the background. And then in some areas, there was a focal suggestion of a poorly formed granuloma. Uh, very, but, but very focally. And notice again, the background of plasma cells and also neutrophils. So this was the same patient that had that proximal two by two centimeter gastric lesion. And so we did an immunohistochemical stain for syphilis here in the liver and the organisms were very difficult to find, but we were able to find them focally. And here's one of those guys. And these are images from the paper from our colleagues at Mass General showing the neutrophilic cholangitis pattern that you can see in these patients with mass forming lesions in the liver as a result of syphilis. Some patients present with these abscess formations and in other patients you can see this plump blend spindle fibroblast uh, associated with lymphocytes and plasma cells. In the liver, you can also see in over half of the patients hepatocellular necrosis, uh, you can see cholestasis and in some patients uh, fibrosis has been reported. Now, in terms of gonorrhea, again, I've only seen that one case shared with us by Dr. Colleague, by Dr. Singhi, who's our colleague at U UPMC. And this one case, uh, if in the absence, in a vacuum, I don't think I would have brought up the possibility of STI. To me, at low power, this looks more like either radiation-associated injury or ischemia because you have a relatively empty lamina propria and almost hyalinized with some glandular dropout but no distortion like what you would see in the setting of ischemia. And then when you look at high power, you can see a predominantly superficial acute inflammatory infiltrate. Uh, and here you can see it at a little bit higher magnification. According to, there are two papers in the literature from the 1980s describing the histologic features of gonorrhea in the, um, in, in the lower gastrointestinal, in the lower intestinal tract. And they report that over 50% of um, the patients who are infected have normal biopsies. So this may be one of the reasons why we are having trouble identifying these cases of gonorrhea in our practice. And my own other theory is that at least some of these cases are co-infected with chlamydia and syphilis. And the inflammatory response provoked by these other two organisms probably obscures the inflammatory response or the histologic changes associated with gonorrhea infection. But that's my own unproven theory. And I'm going to finish with a case. Uh, this is a 38-year-old male, HIV positive, and he has a seven-year history of refractory UC. And it, he was referred to the colorectal surgeon. 
Now, every time I see an HIV positive patient with a history of inflammatory bowel disease, I get a little bit skeptical. I've asked multiple of my clinical colleagues who say that they can count with the fingers in one hand, the number of patients with IBD that also have HIV. So HIV patients tend not to develop inflammatory bowel disease generally. Now, this case was, uh, uh, I was borrowed uh, from Dr. Dora Lam Himling and Mayo Clinic, Arizona. And it shows a dramatically expanded lamina propria, but notice the lack of architectural distortion. Now, for a patient with a seven year history of UC, I would expect much more distortion than this. And then in some areas, you could see a little bit of architectural distortion and also a dramatically expanded lamina propria. Now, when you looked closely at high power, you can see some plasma cell rich areas and also scattered eosinophils, which tend not to be present in patients with STI and tend to be more of a finding in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease. But as you can see here, that is not a hard and fast rule. So if you see eos, yes, you think more of inflammatory bowel disease, but bear in mind that a subset of patients with STI can have a couple of eos in the background. Now, some areas look like this, plasma cell rich, but then other areas looked like this. They will look very lymphohistocytic and eosinophil poor and plasma cell poor. This patient, uh, Dr. Himling, raised the possibility of STI in this biopsy, and she was able to confirm that the infection of chlamydia after laboratory tests were performed and the colectomy was canceled. So this just goes to show you how important our being able to identify these inflammatory patterns are for patient care, especially when clinicians are not thinking or expecting a diagnosis of sexually transmitted infection. So in summary, STIs are making a comeback. Uh, our digestive tract is very commonly affected. These are going to come from our gastroenterology, hepatology, maxillofacial surgery colleagues, not from our STI clinic. So we have to look at that pattern of inflammation to really help us suggest a diagnosis. Uh, the clinical and pathologic features, as you saw, are highly variable. So a high level of suspicion is always necessary. And we should be aware, uh, our awareness of this is key for in order to provide the correct diagnosis and the patients being able to be managed and also prevent uh, onward spread. And I'll close with this quote from Dr. William Osler, who says that he who knows syphilis knows medicine, but I think that he got it a little bit wrong and I took the liberty, liberty of fixing it. So with that, I thank you and I would be happy to take any questions. Good morning, and thank you for attending this lecture titled Gastritis, a Pattern-Based Approach. I have no relevant disclosures today. We are going to be discussing a whole host of patterns that we encounter commonly in the GI service in a gastric biopsy, starting with prominent eosinophils, followed by chronic inflammation, depending on the pattern of um, the distribution, whether top heavy versus bottom heavy, and then followed by chronic active inflammation in the setting of the absence of H. pylori, lymphocytic and collagenous gastritis. And then we're going to finish talking a little bit about the biopsy with a prominent monocytic reaction. Let's start with the biopsy with prominent eosinophils. When we see a biopsy with prominent eosinophils, this brings up a whole host of differential diagnosis, including um, radiation, the status post radiation, collagenous gastritis, multiple medications, solid organ transplantation, and even H. pylori infection. And in fact, there's a couple of case reports in the literature of patients cured of eosinophilic gastroenteritis after H. pylori eradication. Only when we have excluded all of these potential associations, we can begin to think about the possibility of eosinophilic gastritis. Now, diagnosis of eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, including eosinophilic gastritis, as indicated by the blue arrow, have increased since 2007. Typically, patients present with nonspecific symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, but they usually have an associated history of atopy.
41% of the patients exhibit eosinophilic inflammation and other sites of the GI tract. And this multi-site inflammation tends to be more common in children. Specifically, 11% of patients with eosinophilic gastritis have eosinophilic inflammation in the esophagus, and then a small subset exhibit eosinophilic infiltrates in the colon. Endoscopy is typically not helpful. Most over half of these patients have normal endoscopies, and histologically, the antrum tends to be almost always affected, plus or minus the fundus. There are no established um, number, there's no established uh, number threshold for diagnosis of eosinophilic gastritis, and there are no consensus regarding diagnostic criteria. We simply provide eosinophilic gastritis pattern diagnosis when we see prominent gastric eosinophils. But in 2011, Lewin and colleagues published a paper where they suggested the use of the term eosin histological eosinophilic gastritis in patients uh, with 30 or more eosinophils in at least five high power fields in the absence of known associated causes of eosinophilia. We are not in the habit of using this term since it lacks uh, clinical significance, but just for you to know that this term is out there and used by uh, some colleagues. Biopsies show no architectural distortion and no glandular dropout in cases of eosinophilic gastritis. And they tend to look red on low power uh, to the point where you're not sure whether you have a lot of red blood cells in the lamina propria or are they really eosinophils. And it's only when you look at the biopsy a little bit more closely that you see foveolar glandular infiltrate by a bunch of eosinophils. You may see some in the glandular lumina, sometimes with some eosinophilic microabscesses, intraluminal microabscesses, and you may also see them infiltrating the muscularis mucosa, and if you have some submucosa, you can see them there as well. You can also see areas of prominent eosinophilic degranulation, just like you see in the cases of eosinophilic esophagitis. And one important thing to note in these cases, eosinophils should be the predominant cell type. If you start to see other cell types besides eos, that brings up a different differential diagnosis, and we'll go over that in a few slides. What's the treatment for eosinophilic gastritis? Typically, patients are treated with either topical or systemic corticosteroids, and the patients who are refractory may be treated with the monoclonal antibody, vedolizumab. Uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors may be tried, and also food elimination diets. The majority of the treated patients experience a symptomatic um, and histologic improvement. More recent data indicate that lirentelimab, which is an anti-cyclic 8 antibody, uh, and this um, receptor um, is involved in eosinophil apoptosis and is a mast cell activation inhibitor. Um, this is a promising drug for patients with eosinophilic gastritis, as this study um, suggested or indicated that patients uh, experience histologic and clinical improvement after infusion with this drug. So this was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, late last year. Now, if you see other cells, other inflammatory cells besides eosinophils, you need to think of other things besides just idiopathic eosinophilic gastritis. For example, if neutrophils are involved, you think about H. pylori infection, and you can also think of Crohn's disease. These two entities typically have no eosinophilic microabscesses. If you see eosinophilic microabscesses, you stick a little bit more with your eosinophilic gastritis, and also think about potential parasitic infection. And typically when I see these microabscesses, I do deeper levels in the block because sometimes the bugs are just hiding in there. And this has happened to us on occasion. And then if plasma cells are in the picture, you think about autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis. And these are two examples of AMAG, both um, early on the left and fully developed on the right. And you can see that both of them have a prominence of eosinophils. And early AMAG was still a little bit in the way of oxyntic mucosa with this bottom heavy infiltrate and this peppering of eosinophils in the background. And then in a patient with complete atrophy to with pyloric metaplasia and then a more prominent eosinophilic infiltrate. <laughs> 
we can also see eos in the stomach in the status post radiation this was a patient who unbeknownst to us had a history of radiation for lung cancer and the biopsy was sent to rule out adenocarcinoma because of these uh, atypical glands in the middle but notice the low nc ratio together with the big nuclear big nuclei with prominent nucleoli and also some intracytoplasmic vacuoles but the eos really caught our eyes. And when we contacted the contributing pathologist, she was able to confirm that this patient indeed had a history of radiation for lung cancer. And this is another patient with prominent EOS uh, in the biopsy, in, in the stomach biopsy as a result of radiation. And uh, this patient had received radiation as a result of H. pylori negative malt. And typically, we sign out these cases descriptively, a gastric mucosa with marked eosinophilia, or alternatively, you can say eosinophilic gastritis pattern, and then provide a note with the differential diagnosis, and also document, especially if there are eosinophilic microabscesses, that we have reviewed deeper levels, as these, as I already mentioned, may disclose parasites. Now let's talk a little bit about the biopsy with chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation, as we all know, is very subjective. Everybody has a different threshold for what constitutes chronic gastritis. Our approach is we diagnose it when we see it at 4X, when it's evident at 4X. So we see increased dots, which are usually plasma cells or lymphocytes and lymphocytes separating the glands and expanding the lamina propria, and then corroborate at 40X, that these are indeed inflammatory cells and not I was checking to make sure I was um, recording. So we corroborated 40x that they are indeed chronic inflammatory cells and not um, diffuse type cancer which can sometimes mimic chronic and active gastritis. Now for the trainees in the audience I want to um, show you what a normal gastric body should look like. So the gastric body is composed of these oxyntic glands, which are composed or made up of parietal cells and chief cells. And the important thing to note is that it tends to look pinker because of all the parietal cells. And there's very little lamina propria in between the glands. And then you can have in the normal setting um, lymphoid aggregates. These are typically small and limited to the bottom half of the mucosa as we see here. And here we have side by side, the antrum and body. And you can see the gastric body on the right, very little lamina propria appears pinker. And then on the left, you can see the antrum composed of pyloric type glands with a little bit more in the way of lamina propria in between the glands. Now, depending on the distribution, you're going to generate your differential diagnosis. When you have a top heavy infiltrate, you think about H. pylori infection, and we'll show an example in the next few slides. When you have a bottom heavy body only with a normal antrum, you think about autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis. If you have a patchy process with pockets of chronic or chronic active inflammation, you think about inflammatory bowel disease, both Crohn's and UC. And then when you have a lymphocytic gastritis or a collagenous gastritis pattern, that can be seen in the setting of idiopathic collagenous and lymphocytic gastritis, but also can be seen as a result of other conditions, including celiac disease, um, some patients with IBD, common variable immunodeficiency, and some drugs, including omasartan and proton pump inhibitors. So let's talk about the biopsy with chronic inflammation, top heavy infiltrate. And this is usually as a result uh, of H. pylori in our experience. And here we can see that the top is dirty and is chock full of lymphocytes and plasma cells expanding that top lamina propria. And then the bottom is um, clean and it looks like a normal oxyntic, um, oxyntic glands without an inflammatory infiltrate separating the oxyntic glands. Now, typically in the setting of H. pylori, there is at least focal active inflammation. In adults, 
um, in, in our experience, the presence of germinal centers is almost always indicative of H. pylori gastritis, of H. pylori infection. And then if activity is not present, it may reflect treated H. pylori infection, uh, either uh, treated on purpose or the patient has received antibiotics for other reasons. Now, in children, at least one of the following are always seen. Uh, you can have germinal center formation in children as well, but these may be seen in over half of patients with H. pylori negative gastritis. Active inflammation is also common, but compared to adults, children are three times more likely to lack activity. So keep, that, keep this in the back of your head when you're looking at kids' gastric biopsies. Oxyntic mucosa may have moderate to severe chronic inflammation. And then your antral mucosa typically has any type of chronic inflammation except mild and superficial chronic inflammation, which may be seen in normal patients in the absence of H. pylori. You may or may not see atrophy and intestinal metaplasia. Interestingly, infection eradication associated with regression of atrophy and intestinal metaplasia. Infection eradication is associated with regression of atrophy and intestinal metaplasia. And in fact, antibiotic therapy for H. pylori in patients with early gastric cancer or high-grade adenomas is associated with lower rates of metachronous gastric cancer in addition to atrophy improvement. Now, compared to normal, uh, which I have um, shown initially, patients with H. pylori infection not only may have the superficial chronic or chronic active inflammation with a dirty top and clean bottom, but also these very large germinal centers that not only uh, occupy the bottom half of the oxyntic mucosa, but that extend all the way almost to the surface. In my experience, this is almost always associated with H. pylori infection. And in some cases tend not to read the books and exhibit a little bit more of inflammation than others, but still you can see that the inflammation tends to be top heavy with a little, a couple of areas in the bottom that try to remain clean. And then another case that did not read the book, and this was a patient with H. pylori infection that on first look, I did not think that this patient was going to have H. pylori, but my trainee very astutely uh, looked closely and identified the organisms on the h &E, and then we confirm with an H. pylori immunostain. So bear in mind that not all cases are going to have this intense chronic or chronic active inflammation. Some of them have very little in the way. Uh, but this, these are certainly the minority of the cases, thankfully. Moving along to AMAG, and cases with AMAG are going to have a chronic inflammation that is going to be bottom heavy, uh, and it's going to be limited to the body. And your biopsies from the antrum are going to look normal or at most they're going to show a chemical gastropathy pattern. And here you can see that in a biopsy from the antrum in a patient with AMAG, you can see this nice coarse screwing of the glands, which is typical of chemical gastritis. And then the gastric body can show The gastric body can show a whole host of findings. Uh, you can have a villiform surface in cases with extreme atrophy is trying to recapitulate small bowel, as you see here, as indicated by the arrows, uh, in the absence of parietal cells or decreased parietal cells. Uh, importantly, in cases with AMAC, the inflammation tends to decrease as the atrophy becomes more prominent as the oxyntic uh, glands disappear. Also notice how thin this mucosa is compared to the normal oxyntic mucosa. You're also going to see pyloric and intestinal metaplasia, although this may not seen in 100% of the cases, especially in early autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis. Notice how the inflammatory infiltrate tends to be bottom heavy as opposed to the images I just showed of H. pylori infection. So the distribution is very helpful in differentiating this from cases with H. pylori. <laughs> 
And now you can use or explode, um, exploit the use of your gastrin uh, immunohistochemical stain to confirm that you're not dealing with an inflamed antrum and that you are indeed in the gastric body. So in the body, gastric stain is going to be negative or at most is going to show very patchy immunoreactive cells here and there. Now, the other thing that you'll see in patients with autoimmune gastritis is besides the atrophy, you'll see ECL cell hyperplasia, and that it could be nodular as seen in this example, or can be linear and highlighted with a chromogranin or synaptophysin immunostain, and it will be seen at the bottoms of the glands. Uh, but the nodular um, pattern can sometimes be seen just on H&E. And the, the reason for the ACL cell hyperplasia is because of the attack on the parietal cells, they are destroyed. There's no acid, which stimulates your G cells to produce gastrin, which in turn stimulates ECL cells to release histamine. Uh, and that, um, and, and the histamine is, um, is trying to make the parietal cells produce acid, but that doesn't happen because there are no parietal cells. So uh, the this absence of acid keeps stimulating the G cells to produce gastrin, which keeps stimulating the ECL cells. And then you get the ECL cell hyperplasia and it becomes this endless loop. Now, this is an example or two examples of how ECL cell hyperplasia looks in the gastric body on chromogranin immunostain. In some cases, it can be focal, and you can see examples of both linear, as you see here, or nodular ECL cell hyperplasia. And then in other examples, you can see very diffuse um, bottom to uh, top hyperplasia on chromo. Now, if the antrum and the body are received in the same container and you don't have a gastric stain available, look at the different degrees of inflammation between tissue fragments. In this case, um, the one there were all of the fragments appeared as antrum because the gastric body was atrophic. And then, but then some pieces were very inflamed while other pieces, as you see here, were completely um, lack of, uh, or lacked the same degree of inflammation. And that was the hint to let us think about, that made us think about the possibility of autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis. The other thing you can do is look at your chromogranin staining pattern. Uh, if your biopsies from both the antrum and the body are in the same container, on your gastrin and on your chromogranin staining pattern, your G cells are going to be arranged in a very orderly bottom heavy fashion in the real antrum, while your atrophic gastric body is going to show this haphazard staining throughout the thickness of the mucosa. And this is indicative of your ECL cell hyperplasia. So ECL cell hyperplasia will never look as orderly as this. It's always very haphazard throughout the entire thickness of the mucosa, not only limited to the bottom half of the mucosa. And remember, as we mentioned in the beginning, that the eosinophil-rich background is very frequent. And in some cases, indeed, you can have even intraluminal eosinophilic microapsis, as you see here. The other clue that you can use to think that you're dealing with a patient with autoimmune gastritis is the presence of pancreatic metaplasia, a finding that is unusual in the stomach outside of the setting of autoimmune gastritis. And sometimes it can be obvious, such as this, even trying to form this lobule of acinar um, glands. And sometimes it can be very focal and consists only of a couple of uh, acinar uh, looking glands here and there. One tricky thing with AMAG is that sometimes it can be patchy. Sometimes you can see areas that look almost completely normal, and then they stand right next to areas that show or exhibit complete atrophy. 
And that becomes a problem, not in a sleep gastrectomy as here, but when you have a biopsy where you, where that looks almost completely normal, depending on where they take the biopsy, I may or may not think about this possibility. For example, if the biopsy is taken here, I will call it normal today, tomorrow, and any day. But if the biopsy is taken here, I may or may not, depending on my uh, level of experience. Here you can see a little bit of bottom heavy infiltrate uh, but is not impressive at all, and it can easily be overlooked. Thankfully, if you order your chromogranic immunostain, even in cases with early AGMAG, as in, in areas such as this one's with preserved oxyntic mucosa, you're going to see good ECL cell hyperplasia, both linear and nodular. Some cases also don't read the book uh, in the setting of HAMAC, and this is a patient with top heavy autoimmune gastritis in which I initially thought it was going to be due to H. pylori infection, not only because of the top heavy distribution, but also because there were areas with intraluminal neutrophilic inflammation focally. And then when I received my H. pylori immunostain, it was completely normal. And then when I looked back at it, I noticed that there were other pieces of antrum that were completely normal. And then other pieces that looked antral-like that had this pattern of inflammation that included, as we mentioned in the beginning, some eosinophils. And so I was able to order a chromogranic immunostain and show that this was indeed AMAG because of the ECL cell hyperplasia in the background. Now, patients with AMAC can develop a variety of polyps, including hyperplastic polyps, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which tend to be indolent and do not need invasive um, or drastic management, and they can be watched and they will not kill the patient. They also can develop gastric adenomas, both intestinal or pyloric gland types. And also importantly, residual non-atrophic mucosa in the background of severe atrophy, as we see here, may look polypoid to the endoscopist because you have your atrophic areas and then your mound of normal mucosa may appear polypoid and this may be biopsied. The important thing to tell our clinical colleagues is that whenever they biopsy a polyp in the stomach, not only biopsy the polyp, but also biopsy the mucosa around the polyp to evaluate for background injury. Why is it important to identify patients with autoimmune gastritis? Well, this is associated with a whole host of other conditions, including pernicious anemia, iron deficiency anemia. Patients are at, are, are at increased risk of gastric carcinoma, three times uh, the level of the general population, and also some other autoimmune conditions. How do we sign these cases out? We just flat out call them autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis, pernicious anemia pattern, and then say C note and say that describe the gastric immunostain and also clearly state that the patient is at risk for pernicious anemia and that correlation with vitamin B12 levels is recommended because some clinicians do not recognize the association between autoimmune gastritis and the potential development of pernicious anemia. In fact, in our experience, after a diagnosis of AMAG, only 43% of patients get laboratory tests for vitamin B12 levels. Now, early AMAG, the findings are subtle and can be easily overlooked. Uh, these tend to have um, either heavy or mild uh, full thickness or deep lamina propria chronic inflammation uh, with or without inflammatory destruction of oxyntic glands. You may or may not see intestinal pyloric or pancreatic acid or cell metaplasia. Uh, lamina propria eosinophils can be your friend and help you think about the possibility of AMAG. And sometimes you can see parietal cell pseudohypertrophy and parietal cell apoptotic activity. In a study, by our colleagues, at least two of these features are present in over 70% of biopsies with patients who are later diagnosed with AMAG. Uh, 
And thankfully, even in the early setting, most patients will show at least linear ECL cell hyperplasia on chromogranin. And this is a sneaky example of early AMAG showing areas that look completely normal. And this patchy inflammation here, here, and here. And then when you look a little bit more closely, you can see that the parietal cells have some apoptotic activity and are being destroyed by this lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate. And this particular example lacks prominent eosinophils. So not all of them will have them. And then some cases will feature parietal cell pseudohypertrophy. So this can be another clue and notice the very focal inflammation, lymphoplasmocytic inflammation that's trying to destroy this oxyntic gland. And this is chromogranic immunostain on that um, initial case, uh, initial slide of early A MEC that I showed showing you the full thickness, uh, linear and nodular ECL cell hyperplasia. And then for early AMAC, we are descriptive, uh, mild chronic gastritis with focal oxyntic gland destruction and prominent eosinophils if they're present, and then suggest this possibility in a note. Now, what do we do with the biopsy with chronic active gastritis without H. pylori? In the setting of infection, patients with actual H. pylori infection, you may have a hard time identifying the organisms if patients are under antibiotic therapy for unrelated reasons. For example, the patient underwent dental um, surgery and needed antibiotics for a heart condition. Uh, and also if the patient is on proton pop inhibitors, in this setting, the organ symptoms may migrate deep into the crypts, and they also may um, acquire these coccoid or short bacillary forms that can be a little bit difficult to identify. What do we do in this setting? Our practice uh, when we think it's H. pylori, but we don't see the organisms, is to describe the pattern of inflammation and provide a comment to correlate with other laboratory tests for H. pylori. Now, after this diagnosis, within a six-month period, only a third of the patients get tested by, uh, by other means. And 53% of patients that are tested for H. pylori have a positive IgG or stool antigen test. Interestingly, Crohn's patients uh, in this study made up 5% of the overall study population. And these patients had a significantly lower frequency of test positivity. You can have upper GI involvement in the setting of both UC and Crohn's disease. And this was in the past termed focally enhanced pattern of injury, where you see pockets of inflammation of the glands in a background of non-inflamed or with pockets of non-inflamed mucosa. Uh, the inflammatory infiltrate consists of lymphocytes, neutrophils, and histiocytes. Granulomas are uh, typically rare, uh, but may be seen on occasion. And initially, this was reported as a common finding in patients with Crohn's disease, but subsequent studies have found that this is an uncommon finding with a low positive predictive value and also may be associated with other disease processes. Now, this focally enhanced pattern may be more specific for Crohn's disease in children. Uh, a paper by Ushiku and colleagues that looked at 119 consecutive newly diagnosed pediatric patients with IBD found that this vocally enhanced gastritis pattern is seen in 43% of the patients with newly diagnosed IBD, 55% uh, of those with Crohn's disease, and 30% of those with UC. Also, in pediatric patients with Crohn's disease, this vocally enhanced pattern may be seen in association with active inflammation of the ileum and also granulomas elsewhere in the GI tract. Now, patients with UC may present a number of inflammatory patterns in the stomach, including just focal gastritis and this basal mixed inflammation, and also this superficial plasma cytosis that may mimic treated H. pylori infection. Now, let's talk a little bit about lymphocytic and collagenous gastritis patterns. Now, these pattern, the lymphocytic gastritis pattern, may be associated with a variety of etiologies. You can see it in patients with H. pylori infection, approximately 25%, uh, usually, though not always, accompanied by intraepithelial or lamina propria neutrophils. 
The organisms may be few and far between in patients with this lymphocytic gastritis pattern as a result of H. pylori. So when we do our H. pylori immunostain in patients with this pattern, we really examine the immunostain to make sure that we are not missing focal coccoid um, forms. Other associations include celiac disease, malignancy, uh, some patients can have Crohn's disease, and almost a third of patients have associated medications, including NSAIDs, angiotensin receptor antagonists, SSRIs, and also certain pro proton pump inhibitors. And this is what we mean with the lymphocytic gastritis pattern of inflammation. Notice how the surface epithelium is mucing poor. So the biopsy looks blue overall. And then at low power, it looks blue because of the mucing loss. And then when you look at high magnification, you can see a tons of lymphocytes infiltrating both the surface and the bottoms of the glands. Now, the collagenous gastritis pattern is rare and may be seen both in children and young adults. And in the young, in, in, a, in, in adults, it tends to associate with a female predominance. And then some studies suggest, um, demonstrate that the same uh, distribution in children between ma um, males and females, while um, um, others show um, equal, equal sex, sex distribution. And then associated autoimmune conditions can be seen in approximately 14 to 20% of the cases. Patients present with anemia, epigastric or abdominal pain and nonspecific symptoms. Uh, and then on endoscopy, it could show, I could demonstrate atrophy or nodularity. And histologically, these cases are characterized by a thick and irregular subepithelial surface um, collagen deposition that tends to entrap inflammatory cells. And as I mentioned, for lymphocytic gastritis, patients with, with collagenous gastritis will also have surface epithelial injury with epithelial flattening and also areas of complete surface epithelial detachment, as you see here. You may or may not see mucosal atrophy, also prominent intraepithelial lymphocytes, and this is also one of the settings where you can see prominent uh, eosinophils, typically limited to the lamina propria. And then if you are not sure on h &E, you can always do your trichrome stain, which will highlight that thick, but mostly this irregular collagen table that in some areas drips down into underneath, into the underlying lamina propria. Management tends to be difficult for collagenous gastritis. Patients may be uh, put on a gluten-free diet or may be treated with budesonide, caraphate, or steroids. One thing to keep in the back of our heads is that many times these are associated with certain medications, including olmestatin, and injury as a result of olmestatin can have both a lymphocytic or a collagenous pattern of injury. And usually when patients are switched or taken off the medication, they show dramatic injury improvement. So we always include this in our note. And finally, we're going to mention the biopsy with a prominent monocytic reaction. And this is seen in patients with either CMV and EBV gastritis. And the importance of this pattern is that it may simulate lymphoma, as in this example showing of these big monocytic cells. Uh, but notice that the clue here is the background of active inflammation as seen here and here. And this should be your clue to the fact that you may be dealing with either EBV or CMV infection. And this was a case of CMV. Uh, we actually shared ourselves this case with our hempath colleagues because we were worried about lymphoma and they were astute enough to find the CMV uh, cell with this intracytoplasmic inclusions. And then we did our immunostain and it was nicely positive. And this is an example of EBV gastritis showing this lamina propria expansion by this monocytic response, as you see here, but also notice the background uh, is not only lymphocytes or monocytic cells, but you have a peppering of neutrophils also, and that should be your clue, and you, it's nicely positive on the EBER.
And then when, you know, find, the take home message here is that when entertaining a diagnosis of a large cell lymphoma in the setting of an active inflammatory backdrop, it is worthwhile to add EBV and CMV ancillary studies. And I always have a low threshold to show these cases to our hempath colleagues to make sure I'm not missing an EBV driven link for proliferative process. So we've discussed this whole host of patterns in um, the setting of gastric biopsies. But these patterns, or if reporting of these patterns is very little help when identified and reported in isolation. We should always try our best to correlate with the clinical history, either by a chart review or by having a conversation with our clinical colleagues to correlate a familiar pattern with a pertinent piece of clinical information and to identify new patterns of injury and also new associations. And with that, I thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.